the police dog's name was Smokey. And when he showed up, I knew this conference was really doomed. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to William Hearn, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Rubicon should not have been. It was a hacker conference, officially held in Detroit, but actually Romulus, Michigan, and it was just like a lot of other conferences at the time. It's a template that we've seen grow and change over the years with a few basic tenets. You rent out a hotel. You tell people to come there. People submit papers or really proposals with talks they want to give about various subjects interesting to technical people. Then you create either one or multiple tracks that are scheduled throughout the days. Throw in a few contests, panels, games, and you have yourself a hacker conference. Oh, did I mention the insane vandalism, the drunkenness, and the cops? Having avoided hacker conferences for most of my 20s, I was trying to make up for it by going to as many as possible and agreeing to speak at all different sorts of events that would have me. I always paid my own way. I didn't really take any speaking fees until much later, so it was more like a vacation for me and in some ways an excuse to interview people for the BBS documentary. Rubicon was another one of those cases. One of the side effects of never drinking is that all of the events of the weekend are put in front of me with complete clarity. There's nothing I have forgotten, nothing that's been wiped away. It was a young conference. The people attending it were mostly locals who wanted to put on their own conference and not have to make everyone fly around to get to it. The conference hotel was just another generic hotel along a road in Romulus, Michigan. As long as somebody rented the room and was over 21, you could get a room there. Naturally, the amount of people in each room didn't match up to who had signed in. One exception was my room, which I took out alone and kept alone. But there were rooms I would walk into where there were five or six people sleeping on the floor. Without a doubt, hacker conferences, well, they attract really smart people people who like to solve problems, people who want to understand things. And along the lines of intellectual curiosity and sharing knowledge, there's very little else like it elsewhere because the folks who come in from near and far, well, they cross-pollinate. They come up with things to discuss that then follow them for the next year or for the rest of their lives. It was at hacker conferences that I really got acquainted with the sport and the fun of lockpicking, of understanding how many assumptions when it came to computer security we could throw away, and how no amount of theory and plans written down could ever be a match for a person or set of persons focused endlessly on getting around it. Rubicon really skewed young. There were some people there in their 20s, and there were some people there in their teens. And because of all the bonus residents in the hotel rooms, they had the run of the place. I was just another speaker then, known for working on this documentary that was going to come out and, and having done the textfiles.com site. So there were folks who I was meeting for the first time or who were handing me information I could use, folks that have become friends in the years hence. But it was also just a lot of running around and making noise. Besides the people I interviewed in the hotel room, with a makeshift studio that just kept putting people in a chair. Anytime in the BBS documentary, you see somebody sitting in a corner with a lamp that's probably in my room at Rubicon. 
I would also go on little trips around the area to get a few interviews. There were a number of folks within five or ten miles, so I would sneak out for a few hours, do an interview, and, and then come back and do more. One side effect of that was that I probably saw faster than most how quickly the frog was getting boiled in that place. It seemed every time I came back after a little bit of travel, things were getting a little bit wilder at Rubicon. My first hint of trouble should have been the duct tape. There was a kid, a little annoying, a little weird, who had gotten it in his mind that being mistreated was a way to be cool. So they started duct taping him to things to walls, to doors. People started parading him around covered in duct tape. Alcohol, technically, is not usually allowed in public areas. But there's a number of ways to get around that, and people started doing it, meaning that they were getting drunker and drunker. In a hacker conference, usually you have Friday night and Saturday night. Friday starts, everything's a little slow, then on Friday night, people have lots of social events going on, and they get a little wild. Then there's Saturday, and then Saturday night, things get even more wild. And let me stress, not everybody is involved in this. There are folks giving straight-up presentations who are giving good ideas, who go back to their hotel rooms and quietly sleep away. There are folks who walk the hallways, interact with others, uh, have a nice discussion here and there, and then eventually leave the conference unscathed, unscarred, and not owing the hotel anything. All it takes is a few, and Rubicon had more than a few. I'm told that some of the really early hotel hacker cons, the ones that happened in the early 1990s, also had this problem. People traveling, finding themselves in a hotel, theoretically independent, nobody watching over them, and they get a little bit out of hand. I'm also told this is not confined to hacker conferences. But Rubicon was the first time I saw what happened firsthand. There was a moment on Saturday night when People were running around with pieces of the hotel, things they had ripped out of different areas. I heard that somebody threw an M80 into the elevators, making sure that they didn't work anymore. I started to hear other things happening involving fire and sheets and beds. And that's when I came to a horrifying revelation. You see, the older folks, the ones who were locals, who had homes, had gone back to them. But I was staying at the hotel, and I had realized I was probably the oldest person still at Rubicon late on Saturday night. As luggage carts made their way down hallways, and word came that the police had shown up, I was the adult in the room. I was probably going to be fingered as some sort of authority figure or someone for the cops to talk to. And I very quickly made my way back to the hotel room, heard the shouting, and tried, just tried, to sleep. Sunday mornings at hacker conferences are a combination of sluggishness, hangovers, and trying desperately to cling to the dream before the entire thing fades away. I woke up and saw people were still doing talks, and it's always a case that the Sunday morning talks are very uh, sparsely attended. People stay in their hotel rooms and, and make their way out around 11 or 12, maybe checking out and keeping their bags with them. It's just a very quiet time, and I walked around the rooms, thought things had kind of returned to normal, and then left the hotel to go conduct another interview. When I returned later in the afternoon, things were different. Police had stormed the hotel and were in the process of shutting it down when I came in. Folks were walking around quietly, and that's when I saw the police dog, Smokey, who looked like a Mack truck had mated with a German shepherd. And I found out from people later 
exactly how it was going on in a way that became part of HackerCon legend. They were doing the closing ceremonies, which is usually a bunch of people up on stage thanking everyone, and then somebody came in and whispered to one of the organizers, and what he said, in effect, was, the conference is over, everyone's going to need to leave this room, single file, with their hands clearly visible. The cops stood outside all of the exits, and folks filtered out. The conference was over and was being definitively kicked out of that hotel. Because my flight was a little bit later in that afternoon, I found myself sitting in the lobby, a 30-something adult looking all the world, or at least trying to, like I had no idea what was going on. And I overheard the remaining employees. You'd think that people who worked at a hotel would be hardened veterans involving strange happenings and guests getting out of hand, but there was a tenor to their talking that felt more like shocked commiseration. One of them said somebody picked up all of the plants and threw them into the pool. Another one talked about the fires that he had found that were put out in the bathtubs. Another one was talking about where they couldn't find all of the furniture in some of the suites and that they didn't have any idea where any of it ended up. They were completely floored by the aftermath of this event. And I just looked out the door, a pleasant, non-troublemaking guest, just waiting for his taxi. That should have been the end of Rubicon. All of the organizers were given permanent bans from that hotel chain. I don't know if to this day something doesn't blink red when they try to check in at a hotel, but unquestionably Rubicon was permanently banned. That should have been the end of it. But then, to my shock, a time later, they announced that they were having another one. This time, they wanted me to keynote, which I could not resist. The idea of being the first talk that everyone had to listen to, that was very new to me, and I said yes. When I arrived that year, it was in a different hotel, but one that was in the same chain that had banned them. At some point, I asked one of the organizers about this. Apparently, they used an assumed name for a made-up corporation to reserve it, and they didn't figure out that this was really those guys again until it was way too late on Saturday. Additionally, things had changed. They tried to make clear to people this was not going to be another destructive orgy ending in a cop raid. In fact, they asked me to address it specifically in my keynote. I spent five or ten minutes of the keynote imploring people not to destroy things, and the idea of being... Uh, intellectually engaged instead of physically destructive as an expression of your mind. Unfortunately, this made me the bad guy, and there was a number of years where I continued to get harassed for being some sort of quasi-cop. And it brought up a debate that I still think about occasionally. I got into an altercation on a mailing list about the keynote, and the position of other people were that if you go to a hotel that you are spending a lot of money to go to and that you're taking time off from your job to go to, you almost have a right to cause trouble, to get a little wild, and that the hotels are there to repair and charge you for what you do, but they're not there to prevent you from doing it. It's some sort of idea that it's a playroom that you can mess around in and you're paying for the housekeeping and repair, so why not go for it? I don't agree, but at least there's some rhyme and reason to what they were up to. Thankfully, destruction was absolutely minimal at this last Rubicon. There was one prank, in fact, I absolutely adored. Housekeeping was using open radio channels to send requests being made by guests, and people would ask for additional towels, and it would come across the radio as Room 515 wishes to have more towels, or Room 615 needs more shampoo and soap. There was a group of people who were listening 
to these radio broadcasts. And then each time a person would ask for more towels, they'd call the room, say they were the front desk, explain about the $100 per towel charge, and then apologize to them for the fact that it was going to be added to their bill, and then hang up. These pranks sent the front desk into anarchy. And when I found out it was going on, I was standing in a group of people, and I said, okay, that is one of the funnier pranks I've ever heard about. Somebody quickly darted through the crowd, said thank you, shook my hand, and disappeared. So like I said, that was the last of the Rubicons. There were some wonderful people I met at these things. There were trivia contests and talent contests, folks I've stayed in touch with to the present day. It's often the first time I met them was walking the halls of Rubicon through the destruction and the anarchy and, and making friends, which beyond the talks themselves, has always been the reason I go to these. Hacker cons are not for me these days. I'll go to the Hackers on Planet Earth conference in New York City, and I'll always do presentations for people who I want to give a favor to. But the excitement of going into a swirling tornado of craziness and a lot of infosec industry talks is just not, not on my plate these days. I'd rather stay home, interacting with folks and getting things done on a pure online basis. It's, it's where I am now. But I know that there's kids out there, maybe listening to this podcast, who hear about these legends and want to be part of it. Well, if there's one piece of advice that maybe you'll listen to, that maybe I can give you some insight into, it's, it's simply this. The most valuable part of a hacker conference are the people. Given a choice of going to none of the talks or speaking to five people, you should speak to the five people. Gaining new social circles, like-minded folks, folks who will become your friends and your associates for decades to come. That is the treasure of any conference, especially a hacker conference. Don't be afraid to walk up to people who are talking out in the middle of a lobby, to ask a question, to go to find out more about people who are giving talks. Make human connections. That's what is going to change your life and change where your life may go. It's not the size of the party. It's not how much you can drink. And it's not what a conference talk is trying to sell you. It's the people you meet, the bridges that you build. And really, if you've seen one police dog, you've seen them all. This is Jason Scott, Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Forrest Fuqua, Mark Pilgrim, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Rubicon, rest in peace.